2024 was one of Singapore's warmest years in tandem with the hottest year globally. World temperatures officially rising past the 1.4 degrees Celsius threshold considered safe by scientists. So where are the areas in Singapore that experienced the hottest days last year? Well, on the 26th of April, the highest temperature of a sweltering 36.4 degrees Celsius was recorded at the Paya Lebar weather station. In terms of dryness, Lim Chu Kang weather station on the other side of Singapore saw the least amount of rain, or at least level, lowest level of rain, at around 18.4 millimetres in July. That's well below the average rainfall for that month island-wide, which was at over 80 millimetres. There was uh, some respite from the heat at the start of last year. The coolest days were recorded at areas like Newton, Admiralty and Pulau Ubin. Pai Leba also recorded the coolest day of 2024, with the mercury dipping to about 21 degrees on the 12th of July. Our park goers might have enjoyed the breeze at the East Coast Parkway last year. Its weather station saw the strongest wind gust of the year at over 80 kilometres per hour. And to look more closely at this uh, issue, we have Professor Benjamin Horton, Director of the Earth Observatory of Singapore. Thanks for coming in, Professor Horton. Good evening. Now, uh, we ran a soundbite from you earlier mm -hmm. in which you said global temperatures might rise five degrees Celsius, but Singapore will see rather a larger, incre a larger increase compared to five degrees. Why is that so? Well, if you look at the trends in temperature in Singapore and you look at the trends in temperature for the world, they are in parallel, but the magnitude of trends change is greater in Singapore. Singapore has a double problem. It is influenced by fossil fuel driven climate change and it's also influenced by the urban heat island effect. The urban development that has taken place since the 1960s in Singapore has removed vegetation, has covered up waterways, they are natural coolants and they've replaced those with asphalt and concrete which warm up our temperatures. So if we say that uh, the global average temperatures have increased 1.5 degrees C since pre-industrial, Singapore's about double that. So then when we look into the future, if the global average temperatures are going to go up around 5 degrees C, if we don't do anything about our emissions, Singapore will be much in excess of 5 degrees C. And that will have significant implications on Singaporeans' lives and livelihoods. OK, so if we look at the two, you said fossil fuel driven climate change now this is a global phenomenon mm -hmm. and then our own urban planning which is something that we can in fact control so urban planning in singapore if you look at i suppose the needs in terms of growing the economy meeting the needs of the population is there a way in which we can develop our built environment so that we can meet i suppose our obligations as citizens of the planet and also meet our needs in terms of the economy. Well, I would return to your first point, though. Singapore is part of the global economy. Singapore has to have a lead, particularly in this region, for reducing fossil fuel emissions. If you look at the fossil fuel emissions per person, Singapore is the highest in the world. And that is a staggering fact and not a list you want to be number one at. So Singapore has a responsibility as a developed nation, technologically advanced, to reduce its reliance on fossil fuels, to lead the region and lead the globe. Your second question, well... When we think about development in Singapore, we need to make sure that we're considering the temperature changes that go along with that. From our knowledge of the environment of Singapore, we know that if you have natural vegetation and you have open waterways, you can naturally cool a region. So if you have a HDB development, 
Where is the natural vegetation in that? So lot. when you're developing, right. we need to think about temperature changes as well as the economy. Because for too long, for too long, science warnings about climate change have been ignored when we think about the economy, have been ignored when we think about geopolitics, have been ignored when we think about health, have been ignored when we think about well, finance. Professor Horton, if it has been so systematically ignored, what are you doing, for example? You, you just mentioned you've been on these bulletins more times than you might care to number. But well, in, in, in your estimation, your message is still not getting through. No, I think a weakness of all scientists is our inability to get this message across. You know, when I see, for example, the forest fires that are occurring in LA, I have a wave of emotion. I feel a sense of frustration because my words or the climate scientists' messages have not been taken into account. We feel a sense of despair because we've been largely ignored. But we also feel guilty because these projections of what's going to happen into the future, we know about. And we always think, could we have done something differently? So, yes, I've been on your programme many, many times. That's because I've had to give advice on disasters and I try to as clear as possible, communicate that it is because we are a fossil fuel driven economy that we have these disasters. And these disasters will not stop until we change our energy source. Right, we've got the science to give us the evidence. We have, in fact, the technology to make the changes mm -hmm. that are needed. We're not making them, are we? No, we don't have... So when I started out as a climate scientist 30 years or so ago, I believed that if I produce more data, that we'd have action. If I was able to illustrate the solutions, we'd have action. But we simply don't have the political will. So we need a behavioural change. We need everybody to realise that their lives and livelihoods are going to be significantly influenced by climate change in the next decade, the next 30 years, the next 50 years. But our fortune, the fortune that we have is that we still have time to solve this problem. Do we? Yes, we do. We have approximately, science thinks that we have crossed this 1.5 degree I C thought that threshold. The, the, even science said whatever damage we have done in terms of inflicting this global warming change, that is already baked in for the next few decades. So what's the incentive for anyone to do anything now and perhaps reduce, for example, air condition, reduce things that people are enjoying for change well, that they cannot make? Well, you are correct that we cannot... Sea levels will continue to rise. Our temperatures will continue to get warm. Why is that? That's because carbon dioxide as a gas stays in our atmosphere for hundreds of years. So the burning of fossil fuels since the Industrial Revolution to 2024, that carbon dioxide is going to sit in our atmosphere for hundreds of years until we can get a technology that can be applied at scale to remove the carbon from our atmosphere. But the difference between doing nothing and doing something is the difference between Singapore existing and not. Do remember that in 2019, the Prime Minister stated that climate change was an existential threat to Singapore. We hear that existential threat from almost every world leader, but we are not feeling it. Now, you've got 30 seconds, a final message from you to make that change, that behavioural change that you feel is so crucial to our very existence. Well, if you care about your children, then you must act on climate change. Climate change will influence your life, your livelihood. It'll influence your health and your finances. It'll influence where you live. Singapore, a third of this island is only one metre above sea level. The Antarctic ice sheet, the Antarctic ice sheet has enough water within it to raise global sea levels by 65 metres. 
We only need to melt a small percentage of that ice sheet and Singapore becomes the next Atlantis. You don't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen. Move away from fossil fuels. It's very, very simple. We just need to have the political will to make that happen. All right, thanks so much for that. Professor Benjamin Horton, Director of the Earth Observatory of Singapore, thanks so much for coming Thank you. this evening.